2010 was a great year. It is a year of transition. We've had some wonderful programs, both adult programs and youth programs, and uh, I look forward to a wonderful 2011. And we're going to start it all off by having a wonderful speaker. And it's my honor and privilege to introduce Manal Amar, who is our speaker today. And her topic will be Women in Conflict Barometer for Success. And it's a topic she knows a lot about from firsthand experience. Manal is the current director of Iraq programs for the United States Institute of Peace. And I believe there's a folder on every table for anyone who might be interested um, in that um, organization finding out about it, that blue folder. Um, previously, she has worked with the Regional Program Manager for the Middle East for Oxfam, where she responded to the emergency humanitarian crisis in Palestine and Lebanon, while supporting ongoing work in Yemen, Iraq, and Egypt. She has also worked for Women for Women International, which is another dear um, uh, uh, organization that I've supported and have had a sister in other countries for a number of years, so uh, I just always... Uh, it's near and dear to my heart, so that's wonderful. Anyways, as the regional coordinator for Afghanistan, Iraq, and Sudan, Manal has carried out training programs in Yemen, Bahrain, Afghanistan, Sudan, Lebanon, occupied Palestinian territories, Kenya, and many other countries. Ms. Omar has been profiled in many media outlets, including the Washington Times, BBC, NPR, and Newsweek. She was awarded the Silver Medal for Economics Shell 2001 Global Competition for her paper titled Gender Mobility, The Long and Winding Road to Women and Transportation. She's also authored several articles and books. And um, you'll have the opportunity to buy her book, her latest book, or I believe her first book, Barefoot in Baghdad. And she will sign afterwards if you're interested in doing so. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce Manal. Uh, she will then talk and then open up to uh, questions. So, Manal. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn, for such a warm introduction. It's really great to be here um, and also to learn a little bit about Dayton and about Ohio. It's been a learning experience over the last two days. And I'm looking forward to the question and answers because that's often my favorite part of these type of discussions. Um, I wanted to start off by sharing the story. People often ask me about the past seven years and my view on you know, what's happened in Iraq. And um, I quote an Iraqi politician who once described it to me as the seven years of Joseph the seven bad years. And both the Islamic and biblical traditions tell the story of Joseph's ability to interpret dreams. This talent had won him an audience with the king, and Joseph had interpreted the, to the king's dreams as foreshadowing seven years of prosperity and then seven years of famine. Joseph advised the king to store surplus grain during the years of abundance to prepare for the years of famine that were to come. Perhaps Iraq in many ways is the story of Joseph, but in the inverse. The prevailing hope remains that the last seven years were an initiation phase, and the seven good years for Iraq are now to come with Iraq's new power-sharing government that was just recently formed. To make that into a reality, instead of collecting surplus gra grains, what I often assert is that people who are involved in Iraq now need to take the time to collect the lessons learned that we had in the past seven years. Looking back, most would agree there is a lot of lessons to be learned. Iraqi politicians still complain about crucial decisions that were made by the US-led Coalition Provisional Authority, one that has led to a lot of negative long-term consequences. We all know the most commonly cited, that's you know, dismantling the military, the debathification process, and the preference towards expatriate Iraqi leadership. But what a lot of people haven't really spent time looking at is the valuable lessons that are hidden in one of the most unlikely places, in Iraq civil society, and most specifically in the women's movement over the past seven years. From 2003, there's been little attempts to understand what Iraqi civil society suffered and also attempts to heal within the community. And that brought a missed opportunity inside Iraq because there was a lot to be able to extract and to learn that would potentially bring the um, situation in Iraq back on track. 
Instead, there was an urgency to forget about anything in the past and to start talking about a new Iraq, building a new Iraq, talking about the new situation of women in Iraq. Over the last seven, seven, seven years, civil society in Iraq has begun to identify challenges that face the sector and have found really creative ways to address them, some of which I'd like to share with you today. Many development practitioners who are working on Iraq will actually argue that Iraqi civil society is the silver lining around the dark cloud looming over Iraq, whether it will be a success or a failure. Undoubtedly, it's an, an ingredient within the new mosaic of Iraqi poli politics that many neighboring countries in the region still don't have. Although women have faced setbacks, and it's an undeniable in terms of the difficulties they face, the reality is that their voices remain at the forefront as the most active parts of civil society. For example, with the recent government formation, there was no woman that was appointed on the Iraqi government, um, if, whether it was a ministerial post or one of the state councils, and that was a, sh a strong setback compared to 2005. However, if we wanted to look at the positive side, within 24 hours, Iraqi women were able to organize a press conference and immediately held the government accountable, asking where are the women and demanding that the remaining seats, um, be, women be appointed to them. But before we can look forward, I want to take a pause to look a little bit back. It is important to acknowledge that Iraqi civil society, and particularly the women's movement, was not created in 2003. It always existed. One of the assumptions when we went in early on was that Iraq had no civil society whatsoever. Yet Iraq always had a vibrant civil society with some of the women's organizations dating back to the early 1900s. And professional associations, such as doctors, engineers, and lawyers, played an important role in the national debate. Despite the political turmoil, many of the civil society advocates had always found a way to remain active in their community. In 2003, when I first entered the country, Iraqi women were dreaming about ways to leap forward, building on the, the work of their foremothers. Iraq had always led the region in terms of women's rights. In 1958, General Qasim amended the personal status law which provided women with rights on equal inheritance, divorce, marriage, and a lot of other issues that dealt with women's personal lives. Until today, it's very hard to find a personal status law in the region that was as good as the Iraqi personal status law back in 1958. Enrollment of women and girls in rural areas in literacy centers under the illiteracy eradication legislation, which was passed in 1979, led to a whole new level of education for women inside Iraq. In fact, Iraq had actually won a UNESCO award in 1980 for the eradication of female literacy. So women inside were very proud of the history that they were bringing and had seen 2003 as an opportunity to start to leap forward and regain their claim in the region. Women attained the right to vote and run for office in 1980, a right some of the neighbors still haven't been able to attain. Unfortunately, today, Iraqi women have realized they may not be able to leap forward and instead are in an unenviable position of trying to fight for the status quo. A lot of the rights that their foremothers had in the 50s and 60s are constantly being challenged. It is not uncommon to find a grandmother that is literate and traveled regionally who has her granddaughter that is illiterate and never left her village. Women often point out that any parent's dream is to really any parent's dream is to really provide a better future, and it's a difficult position to have to watch generation after generation in Iraq actually slide backwards. Yet over the last seven years, and the focus is really the lessons learned, and one of the lessons that has really emerged that women have begun to talk to in, among civil society in Iraq is that a charismatic leader is not enough. Without the proper institutions in place, leaders in civil society began to realize that they had no real ties to the grassroots, and therefore it was very hard to make any sustainable change. A large part of the emerging groups were rooted in the educated elite. There was a recognition that although the elite save, serve an important role, it was only one part, and that they would need to have stronger ties within their own communities. With the insecurity and transition within government, 
A crucial power often lies in communal, religious, and tribal relations, and particularly in terms of people turning to the informal side of justice, which can have a lot of impact on women. Organizations began to make a stronger attempt to not only expanding their membership, am membership among the elite, but really trying to connect within their own communities with these different informal sectors that provided leadership. In fact, they started to lessen the competition. At one point, there was a lot of competition between the organizations, particularly as they were trying to get attention of international donors and started to help capacity build weaker organizations because they recognized that there would be more strength in numbers. Members of civil society also realized that the phenomenon of what they call a briefcase NGO, meaning only one person who's walking around calling themselves an organization, was an obstacle for any active civil society. And when there were introductions to the personal status law, which was introducing a very monolithic interpretation of Islamic law, these organizations were not in a position to mobilize the grassroots to react. And so they took that as a lesson learned and today have actually been able to have networks which are um, forged between different organizations so that they will have a louder voice to maximize knowledge sharing and to have cooperative advocacy. They were no longer thinking as individuals or separate organizations, but be began to actually develop an identity of an independent sector where women's voices could challenge the, the obstacles that were be they were be faced with. Nothing tells this story not only about women, but on civil society, better than the passing of the new Iraq law for non-governmental organizations. Although there are still many questions about how the law will be implemented, there is no doubt that the new law is among the most liberal laws addressing civil society, again, in the region. So perhaps Iraq will take its forefront once more. This law was passed after intensive lobbying by national Iraqi organizations and supporters within the Iraqi parliament. A previous law had been introduced to Parliament in March 2009, which was very much a draconian law, uh, giving government full access to seize uh, computers, seize the files, watch over, allow people to be registered. And civil society very much stood up and said, we don't want this law to be implemented in Iraq, and were able to introduce new language, which provided organizations with protection. and. Uh, if there is any doubt of an organization's um, activities, would require an actual court order. So again, introducing the component of the rule of law. In fact, you know, the elections in Iraq happened in March of 2010, and it took close to nine months for the government to form. And one of the, one of the reasons why the government was put under pressure to form was the Iraqi civil society, led by three of the women, um, sued the Iraqi government for being unconstitutional. So again, you're seeing where they're using the system to be able to hold their government accountable, a very powerful indication that as things become more difficult in Iraq, at least you have this underlying civil society led by the women to really add some checks and balances in terms of the government. The efforts demonstrated this power of civil society to influence decision makers. It also emphasized the notion that as a bloc, civil society could play an essential role within the national Iraqi debate. I'm purposefully discussing women in the context of civil society rather than isolating out their specific issues because they played a big role in terms of the peace building efforts that took place in the country. But I did want to spend some time specifically outlining the role of women in conflict generally and giving the example of what happened in Iraq. I talk in you know, depth about this in my book, as Caroline mentioned, um, and about my personal experience, mainly because it's important to really focus on the personal side. And for my view, you know, women tend to bear the brunt of war, to really tell their stories so that we're not overwhelmed by the images of violence and the problems of Iraq, but are able to see the Iraqi people. And nothing does that better than women. When we discuss women in developing societies, there is a temptation to really glamorize the story the victim who needs help, the hero who comes and helps them. And my experience in conflict zone is very rarely will women stay victims. They almost always transition into the mode of survivor quite quickly, pulling their communities with them. And survivors also not the place where they stop, they'll move quickly into active citizenship. It's important that in order to understand communities and to keep our finger as an international community on the pulse of the community, it's important for us to be following what's happening with women. And it's why I call them the barometer of success or failure. 
often you'll be able to see where a country is when you check in to see women's access to health care, women's access to education. And it's not just about rights. It's really about what's working, a pragmatic way of exploring what's happening in the country. I remember in Iraq, and I often say that many times, you know, when I was interacting with the U.S. military, they would say things to me like, ma'am, you know, we can't talk about your women right now. We need to secure the country. And I would always tell them, you won't secure the country until you talk about women, until you address women, and until you target women. And you know, according to an organization which was formerly known as Women Waging Peace, for those of you who know Ambassador Swanee Hunt, it's now currently called Inclusive Security, there are several strategic reasons that women should be considered from the very beginning. First is women are community leaders, both with, informal and with, both with formal and informal authority. So they often have access to the formal lines, but they also have underlying networks within their communities that can really create change. And we know a lot of the stories of mothers who will come together from different sectarians who would say, enough, you know, we've lost enough. What can we do to put this to a stop? Women are also adept at bridging ethnic, religious, political, and cultural divides. In 2003, among the first groups to meet across you know, ethnic, the Kurd Arab, across sectarianism, um, across, you know, across the different geographical locations of Iraq was women. And they came together and they, again were talking about their dreams of leaping forward and really provided what the um, different diversity in Iraq looked like. Women have their fingers on the pulse of community, and they also have access because they're viewed as less threatening. And this goes a little bit back to the issue of security and stabilizing Iraq. Iraqi women during the, what, in 2006, during the sectarian violence, which Iraqis refer to as the Dark Ages, mm -hmm. would actually form informal you know, neighborhood watches where they would be able to alert the men because they knew everyone coming in and out of the community. So they were able to inform the men. By ignoring women, a lot of times what's happening is we're ignoring a very important source of intelligence on the ground, whereas we can incorporate their information into being able to provide better services. Women are highly invested in preventing, stopping, and recovering from conflict. And they're among the most vulnerable, so can also be recruited. So it's kind of the flip side of what women could provide in conflict. One is that because it's their children, because they tend to bear the brunt, they're usually among the first to step forward and say, we don't want to see this violence anymore, and to counter the type of extremism and hate speech that often emerges post-conflict. At the same time, the women who do become widows are also very vulnerable to being targeting. So in Iraq, you saw in 2003, among suicide bombers, women were a very small percentage. And then in 2005 and 2006, it kind of spiked up and it tapered off again. And during that time of spike where you see women um, who were part of the suicide bombings, you can also correlate it with a large number of women who had become widows and therefore much more des desperate and easily to recruit if there are not other programs targeting them. Women also make powerful allies for international actors. And this, again, is a double-edged sword because many times political parties will want to use women as tokens to gain international support. And therefore, it's important during the training programs for women to understand that power that they have in bringing in the international um, action. At the same time, in addition to the specific roles that women play in the communities, they also serve once more as a parameter, what I call raising important red flags within Iraq. And this can help um, identify crucial issues that are plaguing the nation as a whole. Many times issues that are simply dismissed as women's issues reemerge and actually turn out to be issues that were much larger and had stronger impact. And I want to give three specific examples of Iraq, which I believe if we had paid attention to as an issue that was plaguing the nation of Iraq as a whole rather than just a woman's issue, we might have caught some early signs. So the first one is, in, and I'll give them in different times, the reason is because Iraq really emerges from 2003 to 2005 to 2008 and 2009 into completely different countries. Um, so in 2003, we heard about several cases of rape that were happening on the streets in Baghdad. And uh, nothing you know, in terms of a huge number which would lead us to believe that it was being used as um, a tool of war like we saw in Bosnia or in Rwanda or Congo, but enough of an indication that this hadn't happened before 2003. 
when we continue to report it to the US-led coalition and to the military saying, pay attention, there are these cases of rape that are happening on the ground, it was dismissed as a woman's issue. This always happens in conflict. You know, Women are a target, they're a soft target, as the military calls them. It's not a very big issue, and we're just going to have to take it as casualty of war. Now, one of the biggest issues on the table for the State Department in the transition between military and civilian is the police. And what we saw in 2003 wasn't just a woman's issue, but it was an indication of the fact that there was no local police force and there was nothing to keep the law and order on the ground. If we had picked up on it early enough and really invested in the police early on, there might have been a different situation when we look at the amount of the, the large gap between what the police are being asked to do and what their ability to actually deliver on. Another example, as I mentioned, was Iraq had a 1958 personal status code, which was very liberal. And in December 2003, the Interim Governing Council, the Iraqi Interim Governing Council, introduced a very monolithic interpretation of Islamic law, which would basically take a lot of the rights that were guaranteed to women in 1958 on divorce, on inheritance, on um, the right to have property. And a lot of the issues that were already guaranteed, it would take it away from women. And when we, again, raise the issue that this is a big concern, not only for women, but potentially for other influences that are impacting Iraq, it was dismissed once more as simply a women's issue. This is you know, issues that involve women, and it's very natural in this region to want to control their women. When in fact, it was a red flag and foreshadowing of the interference of the neighbors like Iran and Saudi Arabia inside the country. And particularly the type of laws that were being introduced were not organic to Iraq. And Iraqi women actually went into shell shock where they couldn't recognize the debate and felt that you know, this was something that wasn't necessarily coming from within. And yet we ignored it, dismissed it as a women's issue where we might have been able to catch early on the rise of Islamic extremism and neighboring impacts on the country. Another example is in 2008 and 2009, you know, w during the time where there's again, because of the sectarian violence, there was a rise in widows. A lot of women's were ha women were having difficulty navigating through the bureaucracy to be able to get the pensions that were promised to them under the new government. And it's a foreshadow of the larger problems that Iraqi government will have, both in spending their own budget and performing the role of government. But often it's dismissed as a women's issue in terms of its widows who can't access pensions, when it really is a larger indication of what the Iraqi government can and cannot do. So when we're talking about focusing on women, it's not just to provide support for women only from a human rights um, approach, which is good enough approach and an important approach, but it's also about pragmatism and being able to be productive and effective in the type of international assistance that we're providing inside the country. I focused on Iraq mainly because that's the country that I spent the most time in. But it would be wrong to say if that the lessons learned were only from the Iraqi perspective. There are crucial lessons that we need to learn here at home. <coughs> The mistakes that were made in Iraq may have cost us the war. I say may because I'm very cautiously optimistic about what will happen in Iraq, and the jury is still out on how this government will form. I believe that with the administration's promise of a long-term commitment and diplomatic relationship, so although there's a military withdrawal, that there'll be some type of relationship between the two countries, there's a lot to be optimistic about. And I do think that in the end, Iraq will emerge as a stronger country. But the process itself has involved a lot of growing pains for both nations, Iraq and America. With the attention shifting towards Afghanistan, it is even more important that we learn these lessons and make sure we understand how to implement them in the next chapter of US foreign policy. Thank you. And I'll open up for questions. Thoughts, questions, comments? Yes. You didn't really say why you were in Iraq, what your position was. Uh, OK. Could you give us a little background on yourself? Sure. Um, I was in Iraq. I was the director of the program Women for Women International, uh, which led me to Iraq in 2003 to establish programs to support women. And uh, the main program was through livelihood. So we supported women through livelihood programs looking for some type of form of the, where they would be able to have access to income. 
and that looked different depending on different cities. And once they had access to income and livelihood, we would then do empowerment and rights awareness courses for women in Iraq. And that was a time that I lived in Iraq from 2003 to 2005. Um, after living in Iraq, I worked with Oxfam and managed their Iraq programs, which is a British organization, and they primarily did humanitarian relief. And I currently work at the United States Institute of Peace, so it's not so much delivery of services as much as it is working on the conflict resolution and peace building element uh, within the country, which ranges from rule of law programs to focusing on protecting the minorities' rights and the vulnerable groups' rights, which usually are women and youth, to actual facilitation between different conflict areas. Um, for example, we've often brought tribal leaders together and had a group of Iraqi trained facilitators that were trained by the Institute go in and try and reach some type of of peace agreements between the different groups. Um, so it's quite a broad range of experience that I've had in Iraq over the three um, different organizations. What do you think will happen with the, uh, the Kurds in Iraq now? Uh, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> Um, well, it, there, the, you, there are two potential, um, two potential challenges within Iraq, roots of conflict. One could be the Arab Kurd, um, and particularly over what's known as the disputed territories, and people tend to focus on Kirkuk. Uh, and I think that what we've seen in this, this government formation is a lot of Iraqi government officials and political parties are willing to make compromise. A lot of compromises that most people watching the region didn't think would happen actually happened. So I do believe that you'll have a um, you know you'll have very difficult conversations. You know, might take several years, but some type of compromise will be reached in the end. And I think the challenge is to make sure that you know conflict happens, just that the conflict doesn't turn violent. And if we're able to play the role of mediator and facilitator, we being the international community, then I think that it could lead to a positive outcome. If it's ignored, then it will definitely result in more violence in Iraq. Yeah, you mentioned uh, 1958 with the personal status law, which I thought was really fascinating. How, can, can, uh, can you tell us a little bit, how, how was it that uh, Iraq was able, what sort of historical factors made it possible for Iraq to sort of be in the vanguard for, for, for this sort of thing, for, for the advancement of women's rights? Uh, the, the question was, um, the 1958 law, what kind of um, situation or context made it possible for Iraq to be the vanguard of women's rights? And I mean, the, the biggest issue is the, a very strong secular way through the Ba'athist mentality is what came through. And, and it was, you know, before Saddam, a lot of people attribute women's, you know, these, these laws to Saddam's time. It was before Saddam under General Qasim that a lot of these secular laws were introduced, including, you know, the education and that women are, it's kind of obvious, more than 50% of the population, you're not going to have economic growth without women. And so, um, the, you know, Iraq was one of the first countries to really embrace that and to immediately put it into effect. And that included a lot of rights um, for job opportunities with in public offices, as well as, I mean, Iraq was one of the first countries in the re region to actually have a sexual harassment law. So you know, they were very serious about creating a working environment for women, and you know, th there was a huge amount of women who were graduating with professional degrees. And it goes back, and, and you know, people often say that as bad as Saddam was, he discriminated based on Ba'athists and non-Ba'athists. He never discriminated on minority or gender or other issues. It was primarily who was loyal to him in his um, very dicta dictatorial way of thinking. When you talk in general about women in conflict, do you find, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm respecting your high level of literacy, and do you find that in the countries that where the female population has that high level of literacy, that is the key point in, in terms of pushing for women's rights and opportunities, and is that more of the voice that your organization needs to get out? And, and where, where is Afghanistan in that movement? Um, obviously, literacy and education play an important role. I, I think one of the things that amazed me was the level of awareness that illiterate and edu uneducated societies have as well. Uh, and you know, there, there is just instinctively this survivor mode that goes among, and I think particularly women, who carry entire communities on their shoulders. And so you will find women who are illiterate, but know their rights um, and will demand their rights once the immediate need is met. 
And so when I first, in, both in Afghanistan and Iraq, when I would do the needs assessment, so within the communities I would interview women, you know, they're not going to talk about education and they're definitely not going to talk about empowerment and the right to be in government. Their first thing is food, shelter, and the ability to buy medication, which is why Women for Women International starts with livelihood. So we try to take that off the table. So the first thing that Women for Women International does is they go in and they look, they do a market analysis because one of my personal pet peeves is you don't want to just go in and do sewing machine or computer classes. You want to really think about what's going to help the woman earn income. So you have to do a proper market assessment within that local area so that they're not just weaving carpets that are never going to be sold and not have income, that they actually are able to find someone who will purchase the skill or the, you know, the need. Um, and once they have that, you can start talking about the quota in government. You can start talking about the constitution process. And even the very most basic women will really get engaged in those uh, conversations. So for example, women that came in, again, if you, if you think of them in terms of the victim, the widow who enters the door, often in a span of a year or two, it was very common for these women to emerge as active citizens within the community. And in fact, some of the women from the conservative city of Karbala that were part of our program ran for office and won. And so you, they started here without any income, saying, you know, I don't care what you give us, just give us some type of support, very much the victim. And by going through this process of you know, having income and then going through training, which provides rights awareness, provides health training, some you know, you know, information on education and access to education, often focusing on um, functional literacy, so not just literacy for the purpose, but something that they'll be able to use. They then emerge, and you know, in a couple of cases in Karbala, women then became part of the Karbala Government Council. So you can see the progress that they have over the span of two to three years. But it usually takes at least a year for them to then move out from the phase of, of basic need. What, what would make you want to switch from one organization to the other? Are they working together? Um, you know, what, what was your motivation for leaving Women to Women International and moving into different positions? Well, um, well personal growth is, is always one thing in trying to explore the different ways that they operate. Um, but particularly from Women for Women International, the, the great part about the organization, I haven't worked with the organization for the last five years, so I feel I can um, complement it without sounding like I'm complimenting something that belongs to me. But one of the great things about the model is they only have one expat per country. So, you know, from, and, and most countries have between five to seven expatriate staff that go into country. And part of my job description as the country director for Iraq is to work myself out of a job. So, you know, when I'm evaluated at the end of my term, it's actually how well I built a local office in Iraq and a self-sustaining office in Iraq. And I'm very proud to say that now in 20, 2011, um, Women for Women's Iraq office is still operating and never left the country, whereas a lot of organizations had to pull out because of security. But because it was an all Iraqi staff, and we were able to train them up, they were among the most self-sustainable. So that was part of my job. My success was training an Iraqi and Afghan and a Sudan um, director to the point where I became irrelevant and was ready to move on. Um, Oxfam was a experience in terms of they're one of the leading organizations in the humanitarian field. And that was a great opportunity in a, in a larger remit. I was doing all of the Middle East. Um, so as a regional program manager, I was able to see a lot more and, and tie the regional patterns that were happening. I mean, to think that any one country in the Middle East is you know, an island or in the world. So it was very useful for me to understand um, the region and a larger extent. And I always um, heard from you know, Iraqis that you know, if you want to make change, you need to go back to Washington, because I grew up in Washington and Northern Virginia. So when I had the opportunity to join the US Institute of Peace, which is a fully independent government institute. Um, it's funded by Congress, but because we don't get our funding through State Department or through the Department of Defense, we, we're, Defense, we're able to um, stay independent. And you know, that was an opportunity to continue work in Iraq, but to also influence policy. And it, it was a new avenue for me to work that I wanted to also explore. This is, this is a wild one. Can you walk us through the, a, a typical day in the life of a Baghdad woman? Oh, wow. Um, of any social class, any neighborhood, the yeah. sense of the realities of daily movement uh, through the markets and so on. Yeah. 
um, I, I would say that there is, there's no such thing as typical, not in the state of war, but in the state of the diversity of Iraq. I mean, Iraqi women, particularly if I were to look at the city of Baghdad, are an incredibly diverse group of women. Um, but you know, a typical day, if you're you know, a student, would be waking up, you're getting ready. Um, you can't travel to the university alone, so you would carpool. You would have several people within the area you know, so that you had at least a car of five idea of safety and numbers. You would have hired the driver, so they call it a line, a khat, that you have back and forth. So you would go, you'd go to school. Um, I was saying earlier about how resilient students are. They will take great risks to go to school. Parents will literally be begging their you know, children, don't go to school, and they will insist because it's their only way of establishing some normalcy in life. So they go to school, and you know, school is pretty much as typical as any other school. They go from class to class, and at the end of the day, they often come home, and that's it. There's no outside um, activities. Uh, more recently, there's begun to be some traffic in restaurants and shops, and you know it's you know it's reemerging in terms of some active life. Along the lines of that day, the typical day in um, in Baghdad would be about four to five hours of electricity. You don't know when that electricity will turn on. So generally, someone in the family will try to stay awake because when the electricity turns on, everyone goes crazy running, do the laundry, do, you know, do this, whatever you have to do. Um, Iraq, because again, it was advanced in the 50s, 60s with some of the best infrastructure, the electricity is also tied to the water system. So the water is brought up through motors. So everyone, you know, everyone's turning on the, the motors to make sure that there's water. And I think the most eventful time of day is when electricity comes, or night, is when electricity comes on. And people try to maximize as much as possible how to get electricity. Um, during the summer, it's unbearably hot. Uh, and it's, I mean, I don't know how people survive without the electricity. Um, so again, you know, very little movement, you know, very little um, activity even within the house because it's so overwhelmingly hot. Uh, so that's, I mean, the t life of a student. For most women, in, I would say in 2003 to 2005, they would go to work. So a lot of women were working, whether it was at a local or like a small vegetable stand where they were selling vegetables, or it was a professor at the university, or it was a medical doctor, they were going to work. From 2005 to 2008, women disappeared. And most Iraqis disappeared. It was the largest movement of, um, of people in the Middle East since 1948, since the Arab-Israeli crisis. And so people don't recognize how large the refugee crisis in Iraq was. And the response was very disproportionate in terms of the need. Um, so you know, just absent. You would walk in 2005, 2006, you would walk in Iraq and barely see any woman. You would go into government buildings or into universities and barely see the females because they were all either outside of the country or hiding because it was so dangerous and violent. Um, and you know, in fact, you hardly saw any of the, uh, you know, the men either. It was just pure violence at that time. Since 2008, women are beginning to reemerge again and organize, and you'll see them going to work and back. After hours, you know, hardly any activity, um, hardly any social life, even weddings. For example, my sister-in-law recently got engaged, and um, her party was literally an hour and a half. And most people spent more time in traffic because all the roads are closed off due to checkpoints. So most people spent more time in traffic, three hours to get there and three hours to get home. Um, and if there was no checkpoints and if there was no, I think it would literally be 30 minute trip. Um, so they spent more time in the car than they did at the event. And usually in the past, before 2003, an Iraqi wedding would be from like 5 p.m. to like 3 a.m. So, you know, it's very, there, a lot of that, those social connections are slowly dissolving because people can't even visit each other. What influence uh, Islam had on women's issues? <sighs> Um, what influence Islam has on women's issues it depends on the, the women you talk to. There's a very strong secular nature, particularly within Baghdad, um, but that's definitely being eroded. So, you know, for example, in 2003, if you were to walk in the market in Baghdad, you would see women of all shapes, sizes, wearing all different types of colors, like, you know, all, literally all the colors. Um, some were wearing a scarf like I would, some would be wearing the abaya, some would be wearing the jilbab, and a big majority wouldn't be wearing anything to cover their head. They, you know, were walking in the streets the same way you would see in any other Middle Eastern country. Um, today, if you walk the streets of, uh, uh, um, of Baghdad, you primarily find women covered in black. So for even for Iraqis, I mean, my husband just came back from December and he spent his entire life in Iraq. Uh, 
and um, he used the word unrecognizable. He said the country is unrecognizable to me, and that's mainly because of this influence. Um, you know, recently there was the call to ban alcohol in Baghdad, um, and. For Iraqis, they're very proud of their secular nature, particularly Baghdad. The South is a different issue. They're much more conservative, and so there isn't as many problems in terms of the introduction of some of the more strict Islamic laws in the South. They're welcoming it. But for Baghdad, there's a strong resistance because they see themselves as a cradle of civilization and are very proud of their pre-Islamic heritage as much as, well, as much as they're proud of their Islamic heritage. Um, and Iraqis have always been the, the um, I would say the, one, the balanced ones in the region who are very religious personally, but also not necessarily wanting it to influence state. Um, so what we're seeing now is a very strong influence of, again, I always use the word a monolithic interpretation of Islam in Iraq that's almost alien to Iraq, and a lot of Iraqis aren't sure how to deal with it. My counter is that the civil society has been very strong in pushing back and challenging, uh, particularly when you look at the rights of minorities, challenging the government as they try to introduce. So for example, they introduced a law to ban um, alcohol in Baghdad, but it wasn't able to pass because people really strongly countered it and said this is not acceptable for the character of Iraq. So there's a lot of back and forth in terms of what the final result would look like. Your sister-in-law's engagement party, and then you commented that the social structure has so weakened the country. How do you see that being fixed, and how, what do you see the results of that being? Will you see less caring among the women? Um, it's a good question, and I mean, you you've you already feel the difference between when I first entered in 2003 and the way it is now. As I mentioned in my talk, women were the first to come together. You had women all the way from the Kurdish region driving down. You had women as far down as Basra driving up and all meeting in Baghdad. That can't happen today. And it very rarely will. Even if it could happen by political will, because a lot of it is the politics, it can't happen logistically because of the violence and because of the issues. And that tends to build walls. When you're not able to meet face to face, then it disconnects and builds walls. Um, and then even within families. So you know, again, you know, just if you're in a different area, it's very much. Um, I, I don't know if you can compare it to anything in the U.S. For for. I, I usually give the example of Washington. There are several bridges that come into Washington, D.C. If you were to shut off those bridges, you would have to go all the way to Maryland to get back into D.C. if you lived in Virginia. And that's basically what's happened in Iraq, is entire areas have been shut off. And for a daily routine, you simply can't do it. So um, in the Iraqi culture, you would visit your parents daily. What's happening now is you're lucky if you can visit your parents twice a month if you're not in the same household. So that tends to have impact. The only real solution is security. And I believe once security is established in the country, particularly in the city of Baghdad, you'll see change happen. Um, naturally, it'll, it'll hopefully, if it's not, hopefully it'll go back to the way it used to be. How do the roles of women, like, how do they differ in border countries? In, sorry, which bordering countries. Um, Iraq has a big border, so they're very different. Um, it, Turkey, it, you've got Turkey, you've got Iran, you've got Syria, you've got Jordan, and you've got Saudi Arabia. Those are the main bordering countries. Um, I would say that, again, typically Iraq was seen as one of the best of those countries because it had that balance of personal freedom and, and um, also um, access to civil law, not just religious law. Whereas countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia, in particular, don't have any access to civil law. You have to go through religious law. And again, a very monolithic interpretation of religious law. So there's a lot that you can do positively with religion. Um, if you're opening it up to interpretations and if there's a dynamic discussion, you can promote women's rights. But what's being applied is often a very no discussion, monolithic interpretation of Islamic law in Iran and Saudi Arabia, which almost always does not favor women. Um, in other countries like Turkey, I argue that personal choice is at, in, in question. You often have secular fundamentalism where people won't even look at religion. So for example, in Turkey, it's illegal to wear the headscarf in a public building, which, also result, which often results into meaning that women who are covered can't attend university. 
So beyond what we feel about the scarf, it's a block of access to education, which is what we should really care about. So you know, a question of how great that is, although it provides other freedoms inside um, Turkey that neighboring countries don't have. Um, Syria is a Ba'athist country, so I don't think anyone has a lot of rights in the country, let alone the women, but it's similar to the Saddam approach, Ba'athist versus non-Ba'athist, not necessarily gender um, issues as strong. They're, they exist, but it's not a predominant issue. And maybe of all the neighboring, Jordan is among the best um, in terms of uh, trying to establish that balance. They've really been able to tackle some of the most difficult issues, including honor crimes, um, thanks to Queen Rania's leadership and really addressing some of the you know, difficult conversations that need to take place in community. So of the different countries, perhaps Jordan is the closest to the strongest on women. But you know, re I think globally, I won't even say regionally, globally, there's a, still a lot of challenges facing women, and particularly after conflict. There's a lot of challenges facing. And, you know, my, I guess the one thing I would end with is that when you know post-conflict environments is also a window of opportunity for change, because often what's happening is you're renegotiating a new social contract. In cases like Iraq and Afghanistan, you're redrafting the entire nation in terms of a new constitution. I mean, how often is it that a country gets to write its constitution? And so if women, and I always add youth and minorities, if they're absent from having a voice in this process, then you know, the only thing that will happen is that more problems and patterns will reemerge down the line. So it's crucial that they're there during this time of kind of a new nation building process, that they're part of it. Otherwise, um, you'll just have issues reemerge constantly, and it's, you're building on a weak foundation. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful, and as a small token, here's thank just you. A, a reminder. So thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. And I, uh, before we uh, depart, I, I have to take this um, occasion to um, thank one of our uh, board members, Tom Lasley, just for a moment. He's cycling off the board right now, and we don't know what we'll do without him. He's not the only one, but he's the only one here tonight. So uh, this is just our way of saying thank you. You have been an incredible influence on this organization for more than 20 years, and so thank you. Thank you. All right, that's it. Now don't forget, if you uh, liked what Manal had to say, I'm going to guess you would love to read what she had to say in her book, uh, Barefoot in Baghdad, and she will stay here and sign it. So you are all dismissed to go have a wonderful evening and safe trip home, and thank you so much. <laughs>